Okay. See? All right, I did my duty. Hi. So, code review best practices. Um, if you have any questions about the session, anything that wasn't clear to you, please let me know afterwards. Just come up. I'll talk to you, give you my Slack username and so forth, and you can help me make it better for other people who might see this session at DrupalCon. So, um, just one other note before we get started. I ask that people not take photos of me for privacy reasons. Um, if I see a camera pointed toward me, I'll sort of like duck out of the way and try to hide. It's a little funny, but it's also distracting, so please don't do it. Um, possible consequences are depicted there. <laughs> so as we were chatting about before, my name is Jess. Um, my username on Drupal.org is XJM, and I'm a Drupal core committer. This kind of sounds like a... Anyway, um, there are actually thousands of people who can contribute to Drupal core, but as a committer, I'm one of about a dozen people who has access to actually accept and merge changes <coughs> into the core Drupal code base which means that they then eventually become part of everyone's Drupal applications. Um, that means that actually one of my primary responsibilities is reviewing other people's code, because I review all of the changes that come into Drupal core, or my, you know, 12th of them or whatever. I'm also a release manager, which means that I'm actually responsible for creating the releases of Drupal that you get prompted to install on your site each month, and I'm a member of the Drupal security team. I'm funded full-time to perform these roles by a company called Agilena. Um, Agilena CEO likes to describe the company as a small but mighty government contractor. Um, we support awesome clients like NASA, the Smithsonian Museum, the White House, and the National Archives. Um, I'm the only full-time contributor at the company, but other developers are encouraged to participate in their contribution Fridays. And there are a couple others who do contribute to core. The company also maintains several contrib projects. It's a great place to work. It's people first, help first, and they're hiring. So have a chat with me if you're interested in. It's, it's, it, I've only been there three months, but so far I love it. So peer code review. The primary goal of peer code review is essentially to catch bugs. It also helps code help increase over time rather than declining. But it's not just about the quality of the code. Software is written by human beings for human beings. So it's important that your code review process reflects that. Put simply, code review is also a tool for building stronger teams. By reviewing each other's changes as they're developed, you build a shared understanding of your code base across your team. And if done properly, this should foster open, constructive communication. It can also create a sense of pride and shared ownership in your projects. And it's an excellent opportunity to mentor junior developers. It's probably the best onboarding there is after an actual like pair programming session. Finally, peer code review will help reviewers and author like, authors alike write better code the next time. The person whose code is being reviewed isn't the only one who learns something from the review process. Of course, if you want your code review to be a positive experience for your team, you need to have a positive peer review culture. Um, I'm not big on emotional labor myself. I find it exhausting to present certain emotions and, and communicate in a way that you know, thinks about the other person. But this is one instance where I, I try to put in that extra effort to think about what the impact of what I'm saying is going to have on the person listening to it and to make sure everyone who's involved in the review process feels safe and supported. Um, code that you write is kind of like stories that you write or your pets or your children have this very like affectionate sort of parental relationship with it. And so it's important to be considerate of that when you're giving a review. The most important thing I would say is that everyone involved in a code review should be treated as equals. The code author, any reviewers who are present, anyone who fixes the tiniest nitpick to the person who eventually merges it. Start from a place of humility. Everyone brings their own knowledge, their own experience, and their own reasoning to the table. We do peer reviews precisely because it's difficult for us to catch errors in our own work. And this is true for the reviewer as well. Um, in the years that I've had commit access to core, I've noticed that many contributors just sort of do anything I say without questioning it. Um, and it, it was kind of interesting to experience at first, but actually I really do want to hear um, the code author's opinions on feedback that I give them. If I say, I'm not sure this is right, that doesn't mean change it to this other thing, that means 
I'm not sure this is right. Can you help me? Can you give me some more information on it? I'm not omniscient. So um, there's an opportunity for the reviewer and the author to learn from each other. And I have a tweet about it on the slide. It's also important to have empathy for everyone involved in the review process to consider their needs and their constraints. Now, the tone of a written review comment should also convey these things. Um, if something seems wrong or confusing, ask a specific question about it. So it'll help both of you understand what's going on. If something technically works but could be improved, phrase your improvements as a suggestion rather than issuing commands about the code. This will help the person reading the review feel like they're a member of the process rather than being talked out to. And finally, when you do disagree about something in the code, encourage others to explain their perspective and then document that perspective in writing. Even if something definitely needs to be changed, it's helpful to have misunderstandings and additional perspectives documented for the future. So I structure my code reviews in three parts to improve the chances that they'll be received by code authors well. And this policy is also, uh, coincidentally, the page on how to write a constructive review that exists on Drupal.org. Um, I try to start always by thanking the author for something specific that they did well with their code. Um, this helps them read the review positively. And it also shows them that I'm aware of all the great work that I've done. I'm aware of the value of the time that they've spent on this. If you dive straight in instead to asking someone, change this, change that, that's wrong, it might seem like a, you as the reviewer have missed the big picture or the overall value of it. Now, this is a bit tricky with GitLab, which is the, the new tool we're adopting on Drupal.org, um, because while there is a feature to batch up your comments and then post them all at once as part of a single review, that um, it's very hard to use. The interface for it is not clear. We have an open feature request out to GitLab. Yes, I saw your comments. Um, but so to, to this point, it, 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 GitHub and other tools, even, even Dreader on Drupal.org, do a better job of, of creating a single review. With, with GitLab, I've had it like crash and lose 30 <laughs> minutes worth of review on code. So I, I, I do now just post the single comments first. So it's very, very important, especially with the first couple of lines that you give feedback on, to be considerate that that might be the first time the person who's posted this code has ever even interacted with you. So you want to have you know, a decent first impression from it. And then so in those lines where I'm commenting on specific parts of the code changes and providing detailed feedback, I try to provide references backing up my recommendations. Now, I've been reviewing core issues for a dozen years I have seen the same kinds of problems over and over and over again, hundreds of times. But it's entirely possible if the author, in fact, probably the author who submitted that same problem again, hasn't seen it a hundred times. So it's good to provide them with doc policy documentation or references to other code or anything like that. Providing reference helps the author internalize best practices for your project a little bit at a time. It also sets a good example for other reviewers to follow so that everyone learns from it and the, the knowledge that you have can kind of propagate out through your team or your community. And then the third part of my review, after all the detailed feedback about the different lines, I write up a summary and then include an actionable next step from the issue. If I've given a lot of feedback, I'll highlight what I think the most important questions or concerns are to sort of like bring that above the fold and to distinguish it from just you know, small issues with minor logic problems or so on. It's always good to give the contributors to an issue the ability to understand what the road to done is and the inactual next step is the first part of that. Now before I get into any more specific advice about the technical aspects of code review, I need to explain some background concepts from psychology. So of all the tools that we use to do a code review, the most important one is actually our brains, right? So it's important to understand what the limitations on our brains are and how we can enable them to do their best work. The first concept I have to introduce is that of decision fatigue. So simply stated, after we make many decisions, our ability to make additional decisions becomes worse. If you've ever come home at the end of a long day and sort of found yourself staring into the refrigerator as if I tell mystical answers, or if you've ever like walked into a US grocery store and just been completely overwhelmed and crushed by the array of choices available to you from cereal and crackers and chips, this is probably what's going on. You've made too many decisions that day 
and you, you just don't have the capacity to make more. We make hundreds of decisions. Most of them are trivial. Um, what to say or text at a given moment, what to have for breakfast. But when you have to make many in a row, your brain gets fatigued. And symptoms of decision fatigue include feelings of exhaustion, mental fog, um, impulsiveness, and procrastination and avoiding making further decisions. And code review involves a lot of decisions. For every single line that we read, we decide whether the code is right, what other side effects that line might have, and whether there's a better way. So that's potentially hundreds of decisions, even in just one small piece of code. Another important concept I want you to think about is directed attention fatigue. When we have to focus on a single task, like we do when we do a code review, our brains have to suppress stimuli from distractions. The distractions can be external, background noise, the kids, the pets, messages and Slack from your coworkers. They can also be internal, random thoughts floating through your mind, feeling hungry, worrying about a bill you need to pay or the session you didn't prepare soon enough for Drupal Camp New Jersey next week. Um, and they can also come from the code you're reviewing itself. Code style errors, bugs in nearby code and so forth are all distractions that will interfere with your review. And this is something we'll talk more about later. Unfortunately, the mechanism in our brains that allows to push aside the distractions and focus on the task at hand becomes fatigued when overused. So if you've, made, if you've been su suppressing too many distractions, you can have feelings of fatigue, restlessness, irritability, apathy, none of which are helpful for fostering that positive review culture. Um, directed attention fatigue can also cause you to miss social cues, which makes communicating empathetically with the person who's code you're reviewing that much harder. And finally, it can also cause misperceptions, impulsiveness, and poor decision making, all of which will lower the quality of your code review. It's also worth pointing out that distractions are an accessibility issue. Um, directed attention fatigue affects neurotypical people temporarily, but it can be compounded for folks with ADHD. There's been research that shows that the same mechanism in people's brains is stressed in both attention in both directed attention fatigue and in ADHD. The important difference there, of course, is that directed attention fatigue is a temporary condition that you can recover from, whereas ADHD is permanent. It takes time for that depression subtraction, <laughs> distraction suppression mechanism to recover um, after it's been overused. And so that's with the reason that some folks um, with ADHD use strategy of taking like frequent short breaks with a timer. Um, it, it, it interjects those little breaks. Overall, you should treat distractions in the workday in general and in the code chain set specifically as an accessibility and inclusivity issue. So with that context, mini pop psychology over, let's talk about some research that's been done on how different factors can increase or decrease the effectiveness of our code development process. Most of the statistics I have in this section come originally from peer-reviewed journal articles, although they're re-quoted in various books and blog posts, and that's how I eventually came to them. I did take the time to track down some of the original sources and I at least read the abstracts. I didn't necessarily read the whole papers. Um, but I'll, I'll list my references at the end, and I'll provide you links to two of the better blog posts that, that have the original sources so that you can do your own reading if you're interested. So the key concept to understand for this section is that of defect detection. This means of the potential bugs or flaws that exist in a code change set, how many are actually identified by a given process? Higher is better because it means you found more bugs before they can actually become bugs after the code is deployed. And the early defect detection is really, really valuable. It's much better to find a bug before it ships. According to one of the sources that I looked at, even low impact bugs are twice as costly to fix once they're in production, and a critical bug can be as much as 100 times as costly to fix. You might have heard the American expression, a stitch in time saves nine. I kind of think of peer code reviews as that, but for software development. And then something you might not have expected also, a formal code review is on average twice as effective as automated testing for, for defect detection. This is actually kind of amazing, that people simply reading the code 
are twice as good at finding bugs as computers that can actually run it. Now I should point out that formal code reviews in, the, in this context is a standardized process that includes strict checklists, checklists and multiple reviewers, um, which is actually, this is part of why Drupal has a two-step review process for Drupal core. When you, someone proposes a change in our community, it initially gets reviewed by peer reviewers, and then once all the peer reviewers agree that it's done and they sign off on it, there's a second stage where it's reviewed by, by a core committer like myself. So that involves more different perspectives in the review process and brings us closer to the sort of formal code review that exists in, in like the enterprise software world. So next I have some statistics on the effectiveness of peer code review with different kinds of testing, and then I'm gonna compare that, or compare the numbers for you to sort of give you a perspective on how these tools can fit together. Um, these numbers are from a few different sources. One of them is Steve McConnell's book, Code Complete, which is very old and from closed source land. So I did actually like look up other papers to, that are more recent to sort of fact check and make sure the numbers were roughly the same. Um, and it, it, for the most part, it held up. A couple of the numbers I, I picked um, from newer sources instead of the ones that are given in that book. So regression tests. They identify about 25% of defects within their scope. At first I was surprised that this number was so low but of course, with regression tests, you don't have the regression test until you know the regression exists. And the effectiveness of your test to catch further problems depends on how well you can anticipate other similar problems with the code when you're running your test. I think this tracks. I think it's really common for a bug fix that we have for Drupal Core to ha update an existing test by just adding a few assertions or a few cases to a data provider that already exists. That makes sense to me. Then unit tests. Um, unit tests can catch anywhere from 15 to 50% of bugs within their scope, or 30% on average. But I said that anywhere from 15 to 50%. The effectiveness varies so widely because whether or not a unit test is even useful depends on the scope and the encapsulation of your change set. Um, furthermore, actually, unit tests can be problematic as well because some people try to misuse them as integration tests and that actually leads to so many false positives that it creates more distractions and actually makes the code review process harder. Um, if in doubt, if you have something that does something at the application level or at the integration test first, don't bother with the unit test unless it's really something that is unit testable. Use with caution. Static analysis is pretty great um, and according to a paper I was reading that's from like 2017, I think it was, it could catch 33% of potential defects in um, code. Uh, we've only recently started doing static analysis on Drupal Core and it has already found a ton of stuff just in the past two years or so. We're still working through cleaning up all the problems that it's found. Um, integration tests are better still, catching typically 35% of defects. Then formal code review, huge jump here to 60%. Again, this is peer code review by itself without any other tool. So this is, this is peer code review if no automated tests have been run, no static analysis has been done. That's the case for each of these numbers. Finally, for context, I've included McConnell's statistic for the effectiveness of large beta tests with over 1,000 users. So over 1,000 people testing an application and reporting back to it on it. Um, those beta tests can identify 75% of defects with the code on average. Just think about all the time and cost it would take to set up a beta test of that size, to say nothing of the free work that you're getting from your beta participants. And it's really clear that the formal code review detects possibly up to 80% of the same things that this large beta test does, but is much more cost effective. So those statistics were all about using the tool by itself. Um, but peer code review is even more effective when you combine it with multiple other strategies. If you combine design reviews, code reviews, QA, and automated testing, it can increase your defect detection rate to well over 90%, meaning that 90 to even 99% of the bugs that existed in the code when it was first written are caught before the code ever gets to production. So you should still write integration tests, still use linting and static analysis tools, all those things will reduce the number of defects in code before it gets to your peer reviewer, which in turn will also make their review more effective because they can focus on the things that a human being can find and the tools can't. In conclusion, 
peer code reviewers are your most cost-effective resource, so you should optimize for them. So how do you do that? How do you optimize for a good code review? Um, I'm going to spend a couple of sections here exploring how you and your team can work together to make your code more reviewable. So this graph is from a free ebook that SmartBear published in 2013, which gathered data from a study that was done at Cisco. It compares the defect, defect density found in a review, the y-axis, um, with the number of lines in a code review, which is the x-axis. Again, higher is a good thing. It means you're catching more bugs that already exist in the code before it goes into production. Lower defect density is, on the other hand, bad. On these huge chain sets with like 700 or 1,000 lines of code, and them didn't just have like fewer bugs per line. They just completely overwhelmed the reviewer so that the reviewer was no longer able to see the problems that existed in that code. As you can see, there's sort of like a pattern of exponential decay. Reviewers are really good at spotting bugs in small change sets, but their efficacy drops off rapidly as the size increases. So why does this happen? The reason that reviewing too many lines of code at once can cause both decision fatigue and directed attention fatigue. Therefore, there's an easy fix. The best way to fix the problem is to reduce the number of lines of code under review at a given time. Split the change set up into smaller logical pieces. Fewer lines to review means fewer decisions and fewer distractions. And based on the data, it's best to review about 200 lines of code at a time. Note that this includes removed lines because you need to read those as well to ensure that the change is correct, that we're not introducing regressions and so on. So you can add up the absolute values of the added removed lines to get the total count. I have an example because not everyone can picture this in their head. Um, this is a random commit from Drupal Core recently. So the diff stat here, this change added 113 lines and deleted one. So that's a total line, of, line size of 114 lines in this change set. That's good scope. And in general, you should never review more than 400 lines at a time. Chain sets this large should be for simple one-to-one -one replacements of one thing or things like that. And so here's an example of problematic scoping. Um, that this is an actual issue that I've reviewed that's still in the queue. It was a bit much. I felt physically exhausted every time I got more than halfway through it. Um, and sure enough, I checked and the scope of the chain set was just too darn big. I'm also showing the very bottom of the diff here. Um, the issue changed 94 files with 229 insertions and 201 deletions. So a total of 430 lines of code under review, which is over our, our upper boundary. And that's part of why the review was hard for me. It's a different graph, but the same research done at Cisco. This one compares defect density found against the weight rate at which the code is being reviewed. So this is the defect density, again, higher is better. And then this is how many lines of code per hour the reviewer was looking at. You can also sort of see the pattern of the exponential decay on this graph as well. Um, there are a few outliers over here, and SmartBear didn't put a fit line on it for us, but I think this is exponential decay too. It is pretty clear that a slower rate of reading code will identify more bugs. Most of the high defect density points are clustered to the left with the slower inspection rates. And if you read code faster, you're more likely to miss things. I think the person <laughs> reviewing 1,300 lines of code an hour over here, there it is, um, I don't think they were actually reading the code. I think they were just skimming, or maybe they were like, had a script that was using Git diff porcelain or something, who knows. Once again, that drop off is inefficiencies when you read the code too quickly because there are too many decisions and too many distractions that you're forcing yourself to try to make it once. And so it's, it's happening too quickly for your brain to recover. So another recommendation is to only review up to 500 lines of code per hour. And I would also say like 500 lines of code per hour, I mean it depends on the person, but that for me that would only be something that's really easy to scan, like a one-to-one -one replacement. If the code is complex or hard to read, I would definitely slow down more than that. Furthermore, um, don't spend more than 60 minutes reviewing code at a time. Now, that 60, that's sort of a, uh, an average recommended maximum. You might actually find that a shorter amount of time works better for you. Maybe you, you actually only want to do 30 minute 
reviews and then take a break um, because you need that you need breaks in between for your brain to recover to, to get back to the point where you can suppress distractions and focus on the task in front of you some folks also might find that like cycles of 20 minutes of code plus a short break few few repetitions of that and then like a longer half hour hour break works better too my sister tells me this is called the Pomodoro method which is Italian for tomato. It has something to do with someone's kitchen timer. I don't know, but it's a thing. People do it, apparently. So speaking of distractions and code review, let's talk now about handling nitpicks. Um, it is actually a really important aspect of code review that does need to be discussed because it's often probably like one of the largest points of friction between the reviewer and the code author. So to me, Reading code style errors is kind of like watching a speaker who has something in their front teeth. Again, this is, imagine me unmasked. I'm standing up here talking and there's something like green plastered to my front teeth. It is no bearing whatsoever on what I'm saying, but I still cannot concentrate on the words coming out of someone's mouth if, if there's that sort of distraction there. And that's how I feel when I review a patch or a merge request that has code style errors in it. They are minor, unimportant, and utterly distracting to me. I can't see your code if your white space is screwed up. I don't understand your comments if they contain grammatical errors. It's a real problem. Code style errors are distractions that increase your directed attention fatigue and make the review harder on the reviewer. Trivial decisions about fixing them are also add to decision fatigue for both the reviewer and the author. But on the other hand, nitpicky reviews are also discouraging to code authors. They've spent hours or days working on something, and then instead of evaluating their design or appreciating their work, you get lost in the distractions of formatting issues or spelling errors. It could seem oppressive or like a lack of appreciation for the contributor's work. So how do we fix that? On the one hand, code style errors get in the way of effective code review, but on the other, they are the least important thing about a change set. So the answer is to use automatic tooling that runs immediately every time you submit a code change before your peer reviewer looks at the issue. Instead of dozens of tiny nitpick decisions about every line in the code base, you have one binary decision. Did it pass coding standards checking? The Drupal core community has now spent nearly a decade incorporating automated coding standards checking into the core process and making core comply with its own coding standards, which it never has, actually. It, it's hard for me not to be melodramatic as someone who's been involved all th through that time about how valuable a difference this has been for the community. It's made our code reviews process so much healthier, so much more welcoming and focused on what actually matters. And here's some of the automated tools you, to use. Um, feel free to you know, take a picture of this, this slide, but not me if you want. I'll also share the slides at the end so you can look at the list. Core has a script that will automatically run these things either um, whenever the automated testing kicks off a test job for a core patch or merge request or whenever a committer makes a commit locally on the command line. These, all of these tools get run automatically. You can also configure jobs for these tools using GitHub Actions, GitLab CI, Drupal CI for contributed projects, or your own continuous integration or QA process. I won't go into like detail about how to set these up, but there's the internet for that. But um, I strongly encourage you to use these tools both for your contributed and for your client projects. Um, also, in each case, Drupal Core already provides a rule set. So if you are using Drupal coding standards, there's a rule set available to you that you can use, expand. And you also have the option to write your own rule set if you have your organization has its own coding standards to enforce. Now, automated tooling can't catch every problem. Um, I have an example here on the slide of a minor documentation fix where someone should have used an at C PHP tag but didn't. And GitLab makes it really, really easy to deal with this kind of thing. You just highlight the lines that your nitpick is about, click the insert suggestion button, which is the one all the way over on the left in the widget, and then just edit the code submit snippet in, in text there in the little box. Once you post that comment, the code author can now commit your suggested change to the merge request with just one button click. It's fantastic. It saves you time having to write out an entire sentence telling them to change the PHP doc, and it saves them time having to make this nitpicky change that you requested. Great feature, highly recommended. So, with all that background information, 
Let's now talk about how we can optimize our change sets so that peer reviewers do their best work. Remember, human peer reviewers are the single most efficient thing you have to catch early issues early safely and cheaply. So let's lean into that. We already established that peer code reviewers are the best resource. Um, but here's another thing that's important for your peer reviewer. They are your first insight into what experience someone is going to have reading, maintaining, using this code years down the line. If a reviewer can't follow your code just by reading it, chances are that it's going to happen again in the future when someone else looks at it. So optimize for readability and reviewability. It's essential that someone in the future can understand the code easily, and it might even be you in the, a few years. This has happened to me so many times. You know, I, sometimes I look at something and I find myself saying, oh, did I actually write that? It's much better when you have the reaction, ah, oh, thank you, past self, for documenting that clearly. I had forgotten that, but now I know again. We also discussed that the total number of added and removed lines in a change set should be more than around 200 to 300. But that said, the line count isn't the only factor in whether or not a change set is easy to review. While smaller change sets are easier in general, it's possible to take this too far. Um, first and foremost, you shouldn't ever commit something that leaves your main branch in an unshippable, incomplete, or broken state. If you were using Drupal about 10 years ago and wondered why Drupal 8's release date kept slipping and slipping and slipping and not happening when promised, that was the problem. Um, it was because of this right here. We didn't keep the Drupal core code based in a shippable state, so we ended up with hundreds of critical issues blocking Drupal 8's release. We changed the policy after Drupal 8 was shipped, which is now with ships releases on schedule now. Another mistake people sometimes make when they're trying to make their diffs smaller for review is they separate out the test coverage and documentation. But this isn't actually a good idea because the tests and docs are an important part of understanding the change. They're part of the whole picture and they give you more information about the code. The tests tell you what the expectations are about what the code is supposed to do, so if you don't provide those to the reviewer, the reviewer doesn't actually know what you expect the code to do. This affects the immediate experience for the reviewer, the shippability of your code base, and also your Git history as well. Finally, scope creep. You're editing a file, and you see something wrong with a couple lines above, so you think, well, why not fix that line here? The problem with that is it adds distractions for the reviewer and forces them to think outside the context of the primary change. It also creates an ever-expanding set of changes that need to be in the issue, blurring the sort of boundary about when the issue is really done. Reviewers can make this mistake too, by the way. I, I got this wrong a lot when I was first doing core code reviews. Um, it's easy to look at a line or look at context lines and put a comment on them about something that needs to be changed that's not actually in scope for the issue. So instead of fixing that one little thing near your changes, Get in the habit of filing a separate follow-up issue for unrelated problems you spot. Just do it right away and then you don't have to think about it anymore. Now sometimes you'll get a reply from a code author that a certain pattern you push back on is used elsewhere in the code base. Even if there is a real technical issue with the approach currently in use, they say, well, you know, it, it was done in this other function in the same file, it was done in this other place, so they don't want to change it. Um, some code authors do respond to your feedback, but take it too far and then go and change every single instance of that thing wrong in all the other places, which is scope group again. And then others push back and want to add new code that's using a known bad pattern just because the pattern exists elsewhere. So both of those things are the wrong approach. File a follow-up, write good new code, and fix the old bad code later. You also shouldn't even fix out of scope things on the same line, by the way. Um, when I was first working on Core in 2011, again, uh, this was another mistake I made all the time, thinking, well, we're updating this line, we might as well fix this other thing with it. Bad idea, don't do it. It's still scope creep and it'll make your reviews less effective. And I have an example of this. Um, so some kinds of changes are easily scannable if you use a word diff, get diff color words. It's great for reviewing things like replacing all instances of a misspelled word, fixing one coding standard, replacing a deprecated method with a new one. If you haven't used it before, it will change your life. Um, so from the diff on the slide, say that I thought a better way to word the method doc block, the, thought of a better way for the thing that's currently, whether this is a writable storage. 
it could be tempting to say, well, I'm already changing this line, so I might as well improve the rest of it. The problem with that, though, is that it completely changes the kind of review that's needed. If the original change set was only a couple dozen instances of removing the E from the word writable to standardize the spelling, that, was very, that would have been very easy for the reviewer to scan. It would only take a couple minutes. However, if we suddenly add a bunch of rewritten documentation, I have to use completely different parts of my brain. Instead of just checking the spelling, I have to think about the entire sentence. Is the new version actually an improvement? Is it grammatically correct? Does it follow our coding standards? Are there other errors being introduced? And what's more is, because it's documentation of a method, I have to then go and read the entire method to make sure it actually reflects what the method's doing. Suddenly what was a two-minute review is instead going to take 20 or more, and that's just if they had one change. The approach to check instead is to get, to get the simple change in and then file a follow-up suggesting the doc block be rewritten. Note that get diff color words can also take a regex to specify what should count as a word break for purposes of the diff. Um, I find that, that using the pattern, specifying the pattern of a single dot is a really, really effective way to scan for like deprecated method replacements. The example on the slide is from a recent change we made to adopt the PHPA stir starts with function, new in PHPA. So the original merge request for this change set was adopting all at once stir starts with, stir ends with, and stir contains, and changing various different patterns of using stir pos and, and stir stir and sub stir and all of the other PHP string functions to use these where appropriate. Um, it changed 300 lines, which meant 600 total added and deleted lines, because you have to read the deleted line to know if the added line is right. And there were like 10 different patterns of replacement in total. I spent like two hours trying to review it and then just gave up. Um, I felt like my brain was melting before I could finish. A clear sign that the issue was not well scoped. So what I did is I split up this issue with git add p, git add dash p, um, and then it's, it's now in five separate issues. This first one on the slide has already been committed, and then the four follow up, the, the next follow up issue is in progress, and probably RTBC by now. So, for this first step that's on the slide, we only have to review three things for, for each of these 100 you know, changes. The first thing is does the original code have a check for whether the stir cost is zero? The second thing is are the comparison operator and the zero removed from the code? And then the third thing is, does the updated code contain the correct logic? If originally the position was, it was checking the position was not zero, then the function call to be negated, down here. Or if it was checking that it was zero, then it's just a one-to-one -one replacement. So now that's only three decisions I have to make rather than a dozen. And there are only 100 lines to deal with rather than 600. Both these things improve the reviewer's ability to give a good review and decrease the time this change set will be stuck in the queue fighting merge conflicts and so forth. And indeed, the first issue has already been committed and the other is in review, so yay. Um, you can see the full details of Drupal course issue scope policy at drupal.org slash core slash scope. It's very detailed. It might seem ridiculous the first time you look at it, but it has actually really improved our core contribution process. So if you do contribute to Drupal core or are interested in doing so, it's worth a look. It includes examples of good issue scope and bad issue scope, and it should be easier to understand how we use in this session. So we have just a few minutes left. Um, I actually might be close to time, but since I started late, I'll, I'll could finish my last four slides. Um, so I have some advice on what I think the most important things um, you should do specifically with a code review. The, this isn't from any exterior source. This is just based on my own personal experience. And these are the things that I wish that people in the Drupal community would do more of when they acted as peer reviewers on core issues. Which probably means that people who are in the Drupal community also probably do more of it on their own client projects as well. Recommendation number one. The first thing you should always do is ask yourself if we should even be making this change in the first place. For Drupal core, there's a corollary to that, which is maybe it shouldn't be a core change, but should instead just be done in a contributed modular thing. Oftentimes, issues that sit in the RTBC queue for the longest are the ones that committers disagree with because they have a fundamental problem with the approach. And they sit there because it's really, really hard after someone's done all this work to tell them, no, sorry, we, do, we actually don't want this at all. Um, we've tried several approaches in the Drupal community to try to get that, that early feedback about whether or not to do something. 
not the best success so far, but that's why I would like to deputize all of you as peer reviewers who go anytime you look at an issue and ask yourself first thing, should we be making this change? One example is that we get a lot of requests for specific configurations and new options to be added to the user interface. Sounds great, right? More features? But the problem with that is that every new option in the interface uh, regresses usability, um, can't add accessibility issues, remember distractions, more things on the page, accessibility problem. Um, so if you contribute to core, keep that in mind. And keep it in mind for your own projects as well. Piece of advice number two. Um, Pay attention to the big picture of what you're reviewing. A lot of people just sort of like focus on the diff and maybe the issue, but to understand a change, you really need to understand the API or APIs that it affects. Read the whole method, look up callers, trace the call stack or step through it in a debugger until you understand the bigger picture of what's going on. If you only review the code in its own context, you might miss something important. Recommendation number three, grep. After Drupal.org and Git itself, the tool I use the most during the, my own code review process is grep. I grep for a ton of different things and probably at least every two out of three issues that I review, I'll, I, I grep the code base for something. If I don't understand something or it looks funky, I check for other places the same pattern is used in core. If the user is only fixing one instance of something and I think this, the same bug might exist in other implementations, I grep. If I want to compare what the author is doing to other uses of the same API to make sure it's being used correctly, grep. Be curious and think not only about the code in front of you, but also the code base as a whole. And my final recommendation, again, be curious about why something is wrong in the first place. If there's dead code, unused variables, incorrect documentation, strange bugs, it really is worth looking into how it got to be that way in the first place. If you delete dead code, without understanding how it got to be dead code in the first place, you could be removing like the last remaining documented reference to an unreported bug. The best tool for learning the history of a line is git log l um, A lot of people say to use git blame, but more often than not, git blame will not give you the information you need. So recently I had someone ask me to clarify a to-do comment in code that I had never even seen before. <laughs> because they got my username when they used git blame on the particular line. In reality, all I had done was commit a patch that changed all the references to URLs to drupal.org so to add a www to them so that there would be a redirect to reduce <laughs> the resource load on d.o from the core code base. Um, and there were many, many commits changing the line before that. So what's on the slide is what the person should have done and they would have actually gotten back to this original commit here that was the one that introduced the problem that gave them the issue number that they needed to look at to go back and figure out what the heck this to-do even meant and figure out what to do with it. Now this, uh, this other issue is committed, but the line is still there. So um, now, one note about the Git log L process. Git is not good at detecting when lines move from one file to another. So if you're looking for something that's like a long time ago, like you know, at least three or more years ago, you might have to like keep go to the last commit in the log, check that out, check up or try check out the commit before it, go to the file where the lines are moved from, and then repeat the process. But overall, this will be your answer. So that's all the content I have. Thanks everyone for listening. Um, and here's a list of the four references that I recommend anyone interested in this topic look at, um, and I will share these on the website if I'm able or in a tweet if not. So the first two are the secondary sources that gave me the references to a lot of the research that I had, data and statistics and so forth. And they also have lots of other great information, recommendations on how to do a code review, really good structured advice um, you know, that's based on all different parts of the software development industry. The third thing is a resource from Google, but it's, open, it's Google's engineering practices, but it's open to, for everyone. And I actually, I read through this and I found it to be really close to the Drupal community's own ethos about how to do code reviews. So I think, it would, I think it's a great reference and worth a read. And then finally, as mentioned, the Drupal core issue scope guidelines. I'm going to press the big red button now to stop because I don't think we have time for Q&A since I already went like six minutes over. But thank you everyone. <laughs>